This episode is brought to you by Talk Python Training. Exploiting is all about learning up your career in the tech space. Learning a bit of Python will allow you to take your expertise and 10x it with automation, APIs, and even AI. The best place on internet to learn Python is over at Talk Python Training. Visit talkpython.fm forward slash exploiting to find your next level. That's talkpython.fm forward slash exploiting. You want to write a blog post. The challenging part is to get in your computer and write the first few words. Mm. Once you beat that, that's it. You're hooked. You're writing. You're writing. You're writing horribly, and then you're writing better, and then you're writing awesome, right? Yeah. So it's very interesting because the challenge is not to write. The problem is that you go like, oh, but I need to write this whole book. But don't do that. Don't write the whole book. Just write three words. Welcome back to the Exploding Podcast. This is the place that I love so much where we resonate by diving deep into the exploiting actions of the incredible technical or business leaders with their transforming life learnings. And thanks to each and every single one of you for coming back every time to learn, to execute and exploit. One other thing that I love about podcasting is that we get a chance to connect with the person and sharing their personal and professional exploits that could have a massive impact on the way we think, we act and the way we communicate and learn with others, right? So so today's guest is the author of one of the best books in reinforcement learning, Grokking Deep Reinforcement Learning. As you already know, he's Miguel Morales. Miguel is a staff software engineer at Lockheed Martin and works on reinforcement learning, missiles, fire controls and autonomous systems in Denver. He's a part-time instructional associate at Georgia Institute of Technology for the course in reinforcement learning and decision making. He developed the Act to Creek lectures for Udacity Deep Reinforcement Learning Nano degree. Miguel holds a master's degree in computer science specializing in interactive intelligence. On top of all of that, he's the author of the incredible book, Grokking Deep Reinforcement Learning. If you are the one looking to adapt self-learning and reinforcement learning, this episode is for you. So I can't wait anymore to start exploring with Miguel Mar Rails. Hi, thank thank you for that introduction, Deja. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you like that. That was so fun. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for joining uh, us today. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And thanks for your tweet, Miguel, that you mentioned that you love the name of the podcast Exploiting <laughs> because you are optimistic and you mentioned that you didn't get the joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I laid up message to you to understand that. So share that to our listeners as well. What's the fun behind the name Exploiting and being optimistic with reinforcement learning? Yeah, it's a total, yeah, reinforcement learning joke. So if you didn't get it, you um, it's it's because it's very reinforcement learning specific and very specific also to a you know a, to a a particular uh technique uh for balancing exploration and exploitation so you know that uh in reinforcement learning we we're trying to solve uh just optimal decision making we're trying to create agents this in this case computer software mm. right that behaves in a very uh optimal way right in a really good way in an optimal way would be the perfect way but you know we're okay if we, if it's not optimal if it's a little bit near optimal right yeah so one way one technique uh well one of the things that the agents need to do is to balance uh, exploration, basically the gathering of information and exploitation, mm. which is basically the use of that information to your advantage, right? Yeah. And uh, there's a technique that is called optimism in the face of uncertainty. Uh, and that technique, uh, that technique requires you to, um, um, to initialize basically your value functions, which is a component that tells you the expected return reward uh, or cumulative reward that you're going to obtain uh, from a particular action. So from doing something in a particular, you know, uh, world condition. Uh, so you initialize that to the highest possible value. So you, you, we say that you're initializing optimistic, yeah. uh, an optimistic value function because you, you say everywhere I go, I'm going to get the highest that I can get which is not real uh, in the real world or in agent <laughs> world <laughs> environments, right? Yeah. Uh, but then the, the second part of that uh, technique is actually that now you can exploit. You don't need to explore at all because you are always expecting the best. Mm. And then so the only thing you do is exploitation, which, <laughs> you know, it kind of matches perfectly with the, the name of your podcast, which I, you know, when I first saw the name of your podcast, I was like, is, is this like a reinforcement learning podcast? That's a pretty nice name. <laughs> 
uh, but I'm so genuine to you that I didn't name the podcast in that sense. <laughs> so that was a surprise for me from your end, so that I could actually speak about this when people ask me like, "What does that exploring mean?" Like, there, there is something like in reinforcement learning. That's the thing. <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. And what about what's your favorite outdoor game? You, you're saying game, game like a com- like computer game, like what kind of game? No, that's the reason I mentioned. Like, what's your favorite outdoor game? <laughs> Out outdoor. Yeah. Man, but I I am a, a computer person. Like what what do you mean game? <laughs> well, <laughs> sports. If you mean sports. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah. I mean, family games I do play some family games and things like that, right? I mean, what what am I going to do? I have two kids, so you need to play games. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the outdoor uh so the I, I like sports. I watch of course. Yes, I'm uh, uh uh, a fan of uh, Real Madrid soccer team. I watch basically uh, every single match. I enjoy that very much. Uh, that would be my yes, soccer. So uh, yes, yeah. So what do you think? Like, how long uh, does it take to build a robot with all those machine learning and deep learning as the reinforcement learning to play the game as a human? <laughs> Uh, uh well that's a good one. <laughs> so now come mean, out as a human. As a human like me or you mean like a professional human? <laughs> <laughs> it should be like uh, a human. No. <laughs> it's still pretty hard, but I you know th- there's this uh RoboCop uh that they they they've been uh going on for uh many years. I would say over a decade. I mean they've been uh um uh, so they have a tournament uh RoboCop is called in Many universities uh, around the world um, try to, well, they compete uh, uh, against, so some robots against uh, the other university. So you create a team of, uh, I think sometimes it's like four or five uh, robots and they're like uh, different, um, I'm going to say categories. Cool. Uh, So some of them. Yeah, some of them are, you know, small robots, some of them are big robots and so on. And and I think they have they have a goal of 2050. I think it was 2050 uh from the get-go uh of being able to compete against humans. Mm. Now, you know, you know, those those dates are usually like uh, you know, kind of wish list and then you just like set a, set a goal that is far uh enough so that you can work a lot uh and then just start working, right? Um so, you know, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's far. <laughs> There's so many things and humans are so intelligent. I mean, it's just a, such a, it's so, we're so incredible. We underestimate how, uh, how intelligent even the dumbest human mm. is. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. yeah. And how about that? Like, w- w- I mean, in the real world, right? Um, when you see like, what's the most exciting thing that you have ever seen a robot is doing in the real world? Oh, that I've already seen. Um, well, I guess we would have to start by, by defining what a robot is, but I've seen <laughs> lots of, uh, things that are ro- robotic. You know, so you have mechanical things moving that are not necessarily, uh, you know, robot human like, mm. uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, what what normally when somebody says a robot uh uh, uh kind of imagines right mm. um but you know i i do work for for a great company that does really cool uh um i'm gonna say robotic yeah. uh, solutions um and i've seen pretty cool stuff i seen pretty cool stuff um you know from from you know uh small cars that do follow um uh you know military people in 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 you know to kind of carry their weight cool um their load uh things like that i mean that i've seen it in person i mean obviously they, there's <laughs> there are better applications you know if you see like uh boston dynamics and things like that it's similar to those kind of things yeah uh in person i would say that one was pretty nice pretty impressive also to be part of uh you know doing that um but yeah there there are many applications that are I guess robotic applications that are not necessarily <laughs> robotic looking <laughs> or ter- Terminator looking. <laughs> yeah, and how about that? Like, oh, uh, what what do you think? Like, when we look into a robot, so we usually see when we see like a robot, like we usually speak about these words like AI, artificial intelligence, and the Q. It's not a human like acts like a human. So, what do you say about it? Like, when we see a robot. So uh, do we need to think about the deep learning or do we need to think about the re- reinforcement learning mostly? And 
it's like what what does it that include like what part of reinforcement learning does it takes yeah it's a really good question i say i think you know so there are many components there right so if if, if you want to be build a human like machine that is intelligent just like a human that moves in just like a human and you know does so many things just like a human there's so many different fields that need to contribute to that right yeah. so you have the mechanical engineering aspect which is something that i have no idea right so i don't i don't even try uh it's pretty hard that's actually very challenging on its own right uh you do have the the uh, uh kind of deep learning um and you know reinforcement learning uh which is the more you know brains uh type of uh aspect of it mm. uh, there are many more right but uh so if we zoom in into the 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 brain aspect of it deep learning would be more like the, let me let me put it this way like the 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 brain cells right so the you know, uh, you know like neural networks just just like that uh the capability to you know hold uh in uh um in in kind of way different uh options right so that hmm. uh the the reinforcement learning seems to be more like a kind of motivation like a like a internal desire for this agent to do something right uh which humans do have those I'm going to say different components i don't know if they are i'm not a you know, <laughs> psychologist but but they they definitely i mean but i'm but i'm a human and i can you know test my 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 <laughs> own uh components right and and you know it seems to be the case that we do have that one component that kind of you know makes us uh you know like a component that you have that make made you go out and create this podcast exploiting right so mm. you had that desire which is separate from your brain cells that tell you whether you should invite me or should invite somebody else you understand and use the time here or there those are different kind of components one doesn't relate to one one helps so one helps your internal goal be mm. realized so reinforcement learning is that internal driver in my opinion that's what it feels like it is ultimately we're going to figure out a way to go away without rewards and have an agent have an internal kind of desire to to go forward and do things on on their own and perhaps a little scary but you know it is what it is perhaps their own desires which uh we're going to we're going to object to that a lot right <laughs> um but but i i actually believe that there's there's something there um that will later many many years from now we're going to have to be discussing in a little bit more um uh uh you know with seriousness like okay let's okay this is not scary like silly anymore this is a real problem how do we figure this one out totally and you know uh I know you have kids so like ha- any time like any of the times in the whole I mean in your daily life uh, is there any time like your kids came to you and asked like dad what was the reinforcement learning like how did you explain to them no because they are too young <laughs> so four four and two one doesn't even talk yet but 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 uh, it is beautiful to see them as a, as reinforcement learning agents and how they start exploring things mm. right they start doing dumb things that you go like well, why are you doing that like this is not going to work you know <laughs> or 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 being um how do you call it like uh persistent mm. uh and and you can also you know reinforcement learning has a lot of theory that uh you can actually uh match to human behavior which is kind of beautiful and people you know i don't know if people realize that uh, a lot i mean i know that there there are fields that kind of you know help each other there uh uh but but you can see uh so if you are familiar with reinforcement learning you can see the same uh kind of on policy learning off policy learning imitation learning all of these kind of sub areas that uh reinforcement learning folks study uh those are present in humans that's that's not we're not fooling around this is actually there uh and it's very cool to actually see that the the one thing that they don't have is well i mean sure they look for your approval so there's some kind of external reward mm. but that external reward is not every time step that external and i'm sure you can zero that i mean i don't want to get into <laughs> into the details but but um i do believe that the in like i said before i think the reward uh seems to be not quite there now i i, I remember bringing this up to rich sutton and why I, so i had him as a guest and then he said like well but you know even if it's internal you say internal uh to the human that doesn't mean that it's internal to the agent so mm. the, the decision making agent is inside the human and the reward 
is inside the human, but not inside the agent, which is a, <laughs> an interesting way of seeing things. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, that, that got a little deep, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was a little deep. Yeah, exactly. So imagine like uh, as your kids grow up, uh, maybe they will like at the age of at a point of time, like maybe about 10 or 12 or, or maybe at 15. So they will get to know about this amazing book that you have written about the reinforcement learning and the deep reinforcement learning, right? So possibly there is a very high probability that they come to you that what was rate form and learning so could you tell me about that like how did you how will you explain to a, a, a huge you know the critical topic like the reinforcement learning to kids so how do you do that how do you do that wow that's a it's a really good question and <laughs> i you know I, i'm a sinner in that because i usually explain it in a very complex way because i i like details and then when i go <laughs> when i go and explain the details everybody goes like oh, okay you lost me well <laughs> but if i had to explain it to a kid to a kid uh, i would probably say Reinforcement learning is a is an approach to creating human-like intelligence um, in computers, right? In a computer program. So I'm gonna create a computer program that that demonstrates human-like intelligence. That would be mm. the most that I do uh, if it's a kid. If I have to go a little bit more, you see, I, I'm 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 a sinner. I told you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. Uh, it's not simple anymore. No, but if I had to go a little bit more, I would say, you know, more. I would talk a little bit more about the, and, and I really like this from Michael Lehman. Professor Michael Lehman actually had this kind of separated reinforcement learning into tr uh, three components. Uh, I would say three components, three three types of feedback that that a reinforcement learning problem usually deals with, which is long-term with, with short-term. Hmm. So you, as a human, you understand that if you, well, as an adult now, <clears throat> that if you put a lot of uh, chocolate in your belly, that's going to hurt you tomorrow, right? Mm. So my kids probably don't know that. If I just give them a bag of chocolates, they're just going to go for it, <laughs> um, right? So you you wouldn't do that. They would do that because yeah. you already learned. So one of the components uh, of, uh, of intelligence there is that you n learn to balance short term with long term, right? You go to the gym, you get fit, it's good for your long term. Does it's not good for today because it's boring and you know you really want to, you know, I don't know, lay down and play a game and whatever. But you you trade that off. And then the other thing will be so that would be one component, long term, short term. Yeah. And then the other would be more like uncertainty. So uh, he calls it evaluative feedback. I'm gonna call it uncertainty. So you don't know really what is the real value of having me as your guest in your podcast, right? You, mm. you don't really have a clue. Uh, you can guess, you say, oh, Miguel, you know, knows reinforcement learning. So people people that like reinforcement learning are gonna listen and that's great and this is, but you don't know the true value, value, I mean, either monetary or, or, or you know, uh, in your heart kind of value, like, you know, gold <laughs> life, just value, the value, how much you value these uh, you don't know the true value. So you still need to try it out. You don't know yeah. if you, you, you know, you need to try that one out. So those would be kind of two main components. And then the third one would be the complexity of all of the things that could happen and, and how to take that into account, which is when, you know, deep learning kind of brings uh, their goodness to reinforcement learning. But yeah, I would, I would explain it like, so, so for a, for a, you know, a 10 year old, I would probably just say that as we're trying <laughs> to create smart, uh, computer program or computer program that uh, demonstrates intelligence period <laughs> and then if it's you know five years older I will probably go with the with the second one <laughs> <laughs> good okay so I wish they, them to come back to you for any other questions as well <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah. yeah but, yeah, but uh, you know the explanation what you're being through like explaining all the stuff and the components level and everything about the reinforcement learning but that made me to ask you about like uh, when did you get into reinforcement learning like why like why did you actually choose reinforcement learning and what made you to deep dive into it you know it's it's very interesting because i don't think it was long ago i mean i wouldn't say i'm a you know world expert at all but i i've i've gotten to like this thing a lot uh, so it was around 2015. I always, 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 since like very young, I, I, I was, you know, uh, I would think about robotics, right? So I would think of of intelligent machines as the robot looking like, right? When I was younger, <laughs> yeah. uh, when I was a kid. But you know, I was I was born in Venezuela. There wasn't much um, of robotic at all, if at all, really. I went to actually to university there. The first year. 
uh, and I, I I enroll in uh, I guess it's called inform informatics engineer or something. So it's computer science, basically the the equivalent. Now you probably know Venezuela went into a little bit of chaos, and uh, you know I actually had to move out. Um, and then so I had many years that I just didn't have that, no longer had that dream. I had to work, right, to actually have a life here in the United States. Hmm. Uh, and then in 2015, I, I just had an opportunity. First, I had the opportunity to uh, get back into my bachelor's and finish that up. I, 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 I got a job um, uh, at at and And as I was, you know, just doing my normal job, I, I started wondering like, hey, you know, you, I had this kind of small dream that I really wanted to do this. And and I actually wanted to, it's kind of funny because I wanted to always enroll in Georgia Tech for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> and all of a sudden this program, the 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 massive, the OMSCS came out. Uh, so uh, really mm. awesome people from Georgia Tech came up with this program to help, to to basically give people like me an opportunity to do what they like doing, right? And one of the first semesters, I think actually perhaps even the first semester, the second semester of, of that, let me see. Actually, the first semester, 2015, fall 2015, I took uh, the reinforcement learning and decision making. Maybe that was my first. I don't know. Anyway, so, yeah, 2015, fall 2015, I, I enrolled in this course. Uh, it was Charles Isbell and Dr. Chad, well, now it's Dean Isbell and Professor uh, Michael Eman, Uh uh, they uh, recorded uh, the lectures for the reinforcement learning and decision making course. Uh, I was lucky to have both uh, Charles and Michael uh, as basically TAs, basically enroll and and actually answering questions in Piazza. So I took advantage, full advantage of it, and I loved it. I was hooked. I mean, even if we actually didn't even do much of deep reinforcement learning, we just did reinforcement learning and a little bit of function approximation, which which mm. would be the deep part. Um, but I got hooked and then, and then I, I immediately applied to be a TA, um, for, for the following semester and, and, you know, they picked me up and, and, and ever since I haven't looked back. I mean, it's been every semester. I think that's really what's, uh, uh, that where, where I learned so much is the interaction with students, you know, this, <laughs> you know, when you have like 300 students, they can come up with really good questions that you don't know, you don't have an answer for. Yeah. And if you do have an answer for, and the answer is a little flawed, if if it's just like not complete, they are gonna they're gonna yeah. discover it. They're gonna find it. It's three hundred students. That you cannot uh, go out uh, go away with you know. It, you have to know the the a, a good way to explain in this. So you take your time. Obviously, not every single time you know live uh, in a in a like I'm doing in this medium. It's usually written. Um, so you have time to think about how do we answer it so that people uh, get get the the message. But I would say that, and then you know, two years ago I started writing this this book. A great opportunity, and yeah, you know, I uh, I don't know what's coming. What's coming next? Uh, well, uh, th there's gonna be more definitely. I'm not <laughs> stopping here. I mean, I think that uh, there there is so many opportunities to contribute, and uh, and look, I'm I'm more than in love with with also the the me the how do you call it the technology. I'm also in love with the community, with the field, with the people. You know how many. Folks actually publish their lectures, their their understanding of the same concepts. How much that helps somebody that is new? Yeah, and I think that's awesome. I, I think I really think that that's awesome. Totally. And when you've been there uh, in virtually, like you are uh, pursuing your masters virtually from your home and not 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 available in person at that at that place. So what I feel like when we go through this college life and learning a lot from so the major of the learnings, what I feel personally will happen through communities. Right. People around you, like when we when we have engagements and people, we speak about them, they have uh, different mindsets and we have different thoughts and we combine them and we think about different things. Right. We come up and we and sometimes the best thing about colleges being in person is also about the practicality. Right. We, you go and you feel the real time with the person and then you actually get the value out. Right. So and also what happened, like when we go, uh, when we try to shift this from uh, this from in person to online. So how did it happen? Like, how was your community engagement and how was your practical things happen? I'm very positive that that we're uh, it's going to be fantastic. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I don't um, I don't miss the college life per se. I, I understand what you're saying. And I 
and I'm a very um, how do you call it? Kind of uh, I don't know. Uh, I like the person to person contact, mm. right? I like to see. So also when I'm when I'm in, in my in my office hours at Georgia Tech, I ask people, students, hey, share your video. I want to see who you are. You know, I know you look ugly, and that's okay. I I am ugly as well. It's just like let's not <laughs> that that's not the point. The point is that you are a human. I'm a human, and we need to connect. And one way to connect is to have quote unquote eye to eye contact to see who you are, to see your expressions, and things like that. Yeah. So I do like that a lot. Uh, however, I don't think that that is a problem. In if if um, the teaching staff uh, is aware of that and do, does something about it, because I when we have our office hours, we I'm, I ask my TAs always always share your video, share who you are, make students encourage students to come forward. As well, and we're not doing office hours in a way of uh, look. I'm gonna explain you concepts. Uh, our office hours are usually in a more. Um, um, I'm gonna tease your brain. Do you have an answer for this one? No. Do you have an answer for this one? Cool. And then we put a lot of breadcrumbs to, for 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 folks uh, breadcrumbs uh, for folks to. Um, to kind of continue there, to kind of like get engaged and get, you know, uh, interactive. Uh, and, and I think that's very, very important. Um, another plus that most people don't see, and, and this may be a, a, uh, a consequence of the number of students that we usually um, have to deal with, um, is we have 300, 500 students. Then that means that um, our our, our kind of forums, online forums are always active. There's always somebody asking a question. There's always somebody responding to the question. There's always somebody ready to contribute. Uh, that You don't have that in a classroom, right? You you only have, you know, Monday and Wednesdays at X time. That's it, period. Mm. Um, so I think that the also, you know, when you have smaller classrooms, um, uh, you, you may have only like two folks, three folks that are like the ones that ask the questions with large communities like the ones we have. Uh, wow. I mean, there there's so many questions. People really want to learn. And if if students come with uh, the best intentions uh, of really learning, I think they can use an online format hmm. to their advantage much better that they can use a... a um, uh, in person type of format. I really believe so. And if, um, you know, I, I hope that in the future we actually look at that into, I know there are a few folks that are actually look, looking into that uh, in, in lot, uh, lots of uh, depth, uh, like uh, Dr. David Joyner uh, and uh, Dean Charles Isbell. Uh, they actually even just signed a deal to, to write a book about these kind of things. Mm. I, I think uh, we're going to see that um, there are other ways to, uh, or there are things that we can do to replace what 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 goes missing in the, or what we think goes missing in the um, uh, in-person classroom. Yeah, I'm very passionate about that, and I think we, there's a lot of potential there. Totally, and I can really feel it, like when you speak about it. Because what I would like to ask you even more on top of that is that um, now the things and the colleges and the schools are shifting online due to the pandemic right and you know about it like things are shifting towards online and you were already been there you are already in a situation where you actually learn from online and you're master of it right <laughs> so what would you say to the colleges and the schools around the world i mean in the world like, what would you suggest them so this is the thing that you are really really need to concern about when you shift your classes and the schools and your lectures online so what was that what's your recommendations for them yeah, I w uh, I'm gonna say the the main recommendation is uh, share your camera, uh, and and I really mean it because when you um so I think the problem is that when once you go online, the very first thing that you do is you think and not just you share your camera, but also the students. So encourage your students to share their cameras. Not everybody's gonna do it, and I understand that. Sometimes you know I was also in my jam jams, you know, taking this, taking oh look at that, uh, taking this uh, um. Uh, you know, student questions and so on. But the the truth is that uh, we're humans, right? And, and humans, you can replace many of these things just with, with the technology we currently have. Uh, so here's the thing. Usually you think uh, when you start doing the online learning, you look at the benefits 
quote unquote benefits, which is, oh, I can be in my jam jams and, you know, and listen to this guy talking in office hours. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to block my camera and I'm just going to listen. I'm not going to ask any questions. But as you go and, and do it over and over again, so I've been doing it for a few years now, you understand that that is bad because that is your brain telling you do not interact. And you know how you learn? <laughs> by asking questions, by interacting, by putting yourself out there. That's how you learn. So you must get your students to do that. If you don't, if you don't do that, then yes, it's going to be bad. It's not going to be good. Um, but I think that our students are... Um, so we, this is my very first office hours. I always go up and up your camera. And then the students, you know, first they go like, who's this guy? He's crazy. I don't like this dude. And I'm fine with that. I'm totally, I take all the heat, not a problem. But once they do open their cameras, they feel the person on the other side. And they, there's a lot of energy as well being transmitted from one side to another that I think um, we, so I think, schools are going to figure it out. It's just a matter of that not first, not this first semester, perhaps, but as they go on, they're going to figure out, I guess we can do this. We just have to, you know, share our cameras, do this and these conditions and so on. So totally. I mean, when we look uh, into the management perspective, this would be the recommendation that you are supposed to be giving now. So that's, that's actually answers my question in the first place. But look at it in the other way. Like, like let me, let me, I'm the person who is going to be uh, learning online from the next semester or from the next year, I'm going to do masters. So I'm being learning from online for the very first time. So what would be your words of advice for me to actually get the most out of that? Uh, yes, uh, participate. Uh, that that is the only actually. Participate. Do do say dumb things. Uh, even if like like um, uh, it, the one thing that I realize is that we as humans have first. I think the biggest challenge is to beat um, what I call inertia. I don't know if I mean I'm sure that this has been studied before, but it's inertia, right? So the very first thing that you need to beat is inertia. Mm -hmm. Once you beat that, you that's it. You're hooked. Right. So when you are, for instance, you want to write a blog post, the very the challenging part is to get in your computer and write the first few words. Once you beat that, that's it. You're hooked. You're writing. You're writing. You're writing horribly and then you're writing better and then you're writing awesome. Right. So it's very interesting because the challenge is not to write. The problem is that you go like, oh, but I need to write this whole book. But don't do that. Don't write the whole book. Just write three words. And then so I would I would do that stuff when I was writing my book. I was actually doing that. I was actually saying, like, I'm not going to write today. I'm just going to read what I wrote yesterday. And then after reading, I'll be like, oh, that's bad. No, let me just change the words. And all of a sudden, I was like five hours into writing. And I was like a, a, a perfect day. So to students, I would say do exactly the same thing. Just, you know, ask a question, whether it's dumb or not. It doesn't really matter. Just pop it out. Put the question out there for the, for for the world to see and then you're gonna get better questions out and better questions out and then you get involved once you get in that cycle now you're learning that's it that's all we want that's all I care about I want you to be learning not necessarily you to know the concepts that are that are kind of the goal because that's that's not learning learning is I guess I, I have a quote there right so it's the training of the mind to think one of these big guys used to say that so mm. learning is the training of the mind to think not the the kind of holding of concepts in your head so I, I, I like students to to teach them to think and to kind of interact with concepts ask more questions and doubt them and things like that I think that's that's more where learning happens than oh, memorize these few concepts and you'll be good. You're going to pass the final exam. Totally, totally. I mean, uh, this actually made me remind like Jack Ma, like once he stated as well. So we are not the machines to remember something, but we are the humans to think about to take the things existing towards further, right? So that's amazing. Like what you said is actually per perfectly apt with that as well. So that's great. And also when we move forward from this academic perspective and being into this to the reinforcement learning, right? I know that you mentioned in your book about the past, present, and the future of the deep reinforcement learning. So could you tell me more about that? Like, like how was the past and how was the present and how is going to be, how the future is going to be? Let's say, I, I actually don't think it's a, a large history, which is kind of cool because, uh, I mean, in reality, I think we've been doing more, you know, artificial intelligence type of things, right? Uh, whether it's reinforcement learning or not, there are many things, many components that uh, we're going to have to, or many, let's say, um, yeah, many problems that we're going to have to solve 
before we can actually have a fully, you know, intelligent, uh, um, you know, computer program, let me put it that way, or human-like uh, uh, computer program. So reinforcement learning, it really, I mean, it doesn't have a very large history. I mean, I would say probably 50s or so. Uh, I'm going to say that, uh, you know, Rich Sutton uh, does have um, a, a lot of the, and, and, and you know, his, his living uh, history <laughs> is uh, definitely a, 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 a great uh, uh, source for that. I would say he did most of the early research uh, when most people were doing just neural networks uh, or SVMs or, well, Near Networks got, uh, was just Jan LeCun and a few other folks, so maybe remove that one. But there, there were only a few areas that were, you know, being looked at. And I think it was mostly because we as humans want to see the thing work ASAP, right? Yeah. And um, the easiest way for uh, us to see a human-like intelligence is to kind of program a lot of knowledge in, in a computer program and then just say like, look, I ask him a question. The question is, what is your name? And the computer program says, my name is Lisa. And then you go like, whoa, okay, that is outstanding. It's intelligent. Uh, no, it is not. Ask, ask him something else. You know, what is your surname? Uh, don't find an answer, <laughs> right? So, um, <laughs> so we, we, we try, so I think what happened back in, you know, back in the fifties around that time is a lot of people wanted to see the, the computer program saying, my name is X, you know, and answering this question. So the pressure is then to build knowledge based agents, agents that have a lot of knowledge accumulated and they know how to answer, how to behave given certain conditions, right? Uh, but then as we progressed, I mean, uh, and, and in this case, you know, Richard, Richard Sutton, uh, uh, and, uh, well, I guess Andrew, Andy Barto, um, and some of those folks, and there, uh, I forget the club, I think is the name of their, their uh, advisor. But those folks uh, continue working reinforcement learning. As other folks were working like uh, deep learning, right? So like uh, Jan Lacoon, Joshi Avengio, uh, and Hinton, I guess. So some of the, the, they continue working the 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 real artificial intelligence as other folks you know just got the results right so i think that's really why we are here right now is because those folks really paid attention to to what matters um and um yeah i'll be honest i mean i don't want to bash anybody even <laughs> the ones that work knowledge base in the past yeah. to be honest i mean they they carry they carry the load for all this time so that we still have a field right because otherwise funding would be gone totally gone for for some of these guys yeah. anyway i don't know really you know i'm not an old person i'm not gonna pretend that i know the history <laughs> you know from perfectly but i think that's really what happened uh and i think in the future um I'm going to say, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, there's uh, for, for some reason, there's going to be uh, a lot of, we're going to continue to see a lot of um, uh, improved results that are based on um, compute, better compute, better, you know, bigger computers and so on. Because at the end of the, the day, um, and, I, and I, I stole this one from Rich Sutton, this is not mine, is algorithms that can scale with compute are, are the future. That's that's where it goes. So if your algorithm is is getting better just because you have a funky technique and you're hard coding something, that is basically the equivalent to what the folks in the 50s were doing in knowledge base AI, that you should probably not work on that. And if you find, you should work in more like, you know, uh, sort of algorithms that scale with compute, you know, either evaluation uh, or, you know, estimation of, of values, um, perhaps search, things like that. So, yeah, I think that's uh, that's what's going to, that's what's going to, um, um, that's where the money is <laughs> in, in terms of, uh, in, ter in terms of research. I, I don't mean no money, money. I mean uh, research money, right? Yeah. So what about your first and very first project that you worked on reinforcement learning that literally enlightened you with a lot of knowledge? So what was that? Can you talk more about your first personal experience with reinforcement learning, applying and learning from it? Wow, that's a really good question. I So the very first one would be um, I created um, a kind of, um, let's see, a, a, a kind of tutorial, online tutorial. Hmm. I think I call it um, applied reinforcement learning. 
that tutorial became the book later, right? But it was really a, just a, uh, a Jupyter notebook uh, that had uh, lots of uh, resources and really rough explanations of what reinforcement learning is. Um, and, and I think implementing many algorithms really helped. Um, wow. It helped so much. I mean, you have no idea how bad or how bad of an understanding you have until you, you implement uh, the algorithms. And then you just like miss one little tiny thing. Like you miss like uh, you use this action versus some other action. And all of a sudden, nothing works. Yeah. And then you change the action and everything works. And you're like, <laughs> wow, okay, I missed that. That was very impressive. So I, I would say that, that implementing the algorithms more than an actual like... Um, I'm gonna say like an application, mm. um, which I I have I have those a lot more mostly work, uh, the applications like serious applications yeah. that you need to really test your things. Um, those I would say those those are good for kind of you know developing you as a kind of professional like you gotta you gotta produce high quality uh, software. Cool. But reinforcement learning, I think the most one was uh, yeah just implementing as many algorithms as I could. Wow, that's that's really a good way of you know, learning. Yeah. Yeah. And also when we, when we actually try to learn from the research papers and also try to implement them to actually get the better understanding of the whole concept. So, uh, I feel so hard. I'm being so genuine. Like I couldn't get the uh, context of the paper <laughs> in the very first time. Like it takes me a lot of time to read it again, read it again. And you, and then you get the best understanding of the research papers. Right. So w what sort of approach that you follow to and actually understand research paper? And, uh, you know, there are many challenges what I feel. So how do you overcome like getting, I mean, breaking down the research paper and making them into the work? Yeah. You know what, how, how you do it? Just reading it five, 10 times. <laughs> you don't, the problem is the problem is that one thinks that you can just read it and understand it and you go like just top to bottom and you go like gosh i didn't get nothing out of this paper like what's going on with me am i wrong no you're not wrong that's the way it is just go again and then you go like whoa okay so i had i i guess i don't know what happened i didn't read this part before i don't know do it again do it again once you read it like five times and i mean like instead of spending five hours reading it one time spend five hours reading it 10 times, like go faster, <laughs> top to bottom, and your brain is going to capture still things in a better, better way. So that's how I do it. And, and it's actually pretty successful that way. Hmm. I know that there are, you know, techniques and people go like, oh, read the abstract first and then, you know, make, take notes doing this. And I don't know about that. I really don't. I, I, I feel that, I feel like it's, th there's two things, right? So you as a human, you eat to get energy into your body, right? And then you can do something. You don't do the two at the same time. And it's kind of weird. You can go work out with a, with a sandwich. It's just weird. You don't do it, right? Yeah. When you are, when you're reading a paper, you're eating, all right? So just go and eat and then do it again and do it again. And you're fueling your body. You're fully fueling really your brain in understanding, okay? Now, you have all that energy in there. You know what happens if you don't work out? You get fat. Yeah. You get ugly. <laughs> okay, don't do that. Don't let your brain get fat. Go ahead and now create. So put, start coding, start writing now. But after after you read, so it's two different things. Read first, that's ingest energy that somebody else create creates, right? And then go ahead and burn that those calories to create a good fit brain, right? So now you go into the computer and then start programming that, and then go like, oh, I don't understand. Now you're gonna run out of energy. Guess what you're going to do again? Go back to the paper, read it again. Now you consume more energy. Go like that. I, that's how I feel. I know it's a little bit like, okay, Miguel, you're you're doing analogies for everything. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yes, I don't mean to do that every time. But it does work, though. It does work. If you do that, just read the paper five times. Think, they go try to program or code You know what you just read about. You're going to run out of energy. Come back tomorrow. Read it again. Try to do it again and so on. And that's actually how I, I think how you can consume papers and understand them uh, pretty well. They actually stick in your brain as well, you know, like because you implement it and you, you know it. Yeah. And those those analogies are actually so great. Like when you mentioned, like you're giving it the analogies for everything. But when you give such analogies, 
uh, it actually makes me you know understand it so better it actually gives me a vivid understanding about what the actual con- context is and also as you mentioned uh, about when we actually go and read about it and we read about it and then you get that and you actually need to implement to actually burn the fats <laughs> right and i think uh, most of the times when we go through the process we forget to digest it right what you mentioned is that like we need to digest that well done sir yes <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, you got it. You got it straight because a lot of people also think like I'm going to have the paper and you know, I have a bunch of papers here. So <laughs> it's like that I'm, you know, I'm reading this one curriculum learning for reinforcement learning domains. Ah, I'm going to read this thing. I'm going to code it right now or I'm going to read it and immediately go and code it. No, no, no. Let it digest. And yeah. Let it sink in your brain. Don't do anything. Let that all that material sink in your brain, come back in a few hours and then now try to do it. It's completely different ball game. Yes. Absolutely. Well done. Yeah. So and also when we speak about your analogies they are absolutely amazing because I've been going through a book and one of the best thing that I really uh, found in the very beginning of the book is about uh, the chinese form of uh, analogy that the parable and uh, that was like good news bad news what we can say like <laughs> that was so fascinating and that was the best ever intro for any topics that I ever read so I would love to really hear from you <laughs> like can you just tell me about what about that analogy and how could you relate it to the uh, reinforcement learning because it's related to life i think this is really uh, and in and, and this one in particular is because it's evaluative feedback in my way the of seeing so the the parable goes that the uh uh well, chinese farmer i don't know the details that actually exactly i usually look them up but but in, in the 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 bottom line is that the the guy basically has a lot of fortunes and misfortunes and uh you know people around say like hey you know that's really bad luck that's yeah. really good luck you know depending on what happened in, in in his life and he was like you know i don't know we'll see but it was the the funny case is that every misfortune was followed by a by a good fortune and every good fortune by a misfortune yeah. and it seemed to be related like you know the reason why this misfortune happened is because of the good fortune that i had before and so on so uh, you know, the guy loses the horse and the horse then you just go as away and then it the, and then it's like, oh, so bad you lost your horse. And then three weeks later, the horse comes back with five more horses. Yeah. Oh, that's good fortune and so on. So the story <laughs> goes on like that. And, and you can imagine that. And I think the the. Uh, the one thing is like we are very so it's evaluative feedback. We are very concerned with humans are very concerned with looking for the value of things. Right. And, you know, we make a big deal out of it. Like, oh, you know, I lost this. This is terrible. I, I got fired. How many people have, you know, gone through things like that? Like, you know, oh, I got fired. And all of a sudden I found my company and I'm super successful, right? Yeah. Things like that. So um, the message there is that is that we really don't know. We really, and I don't really think we will know ever. I mean, I think this is, life is designed this way so that we enjoy it, right? Yeah. So at one point you get like, you know, like the Chinese farmer, it's like, I I have no clue. I'm just going to live life, right? I'm just going to be in the present and enjoy the moment. Uh, and I think that's the message. Now, for reinforcement learning, it's more applied to the evaluative feedback, but it's a little bit, you know, extra. I usually like to also tease uh, human brains so that they become happier yeah. humans, right? <laughs> totally. Uh, and also, like, let's take it this way. Like, imagine uh, tomorrow is the day where you're going to train uh, 20 people about the reinforcement learning, including me. <laughs> so... Uh, what do you do with them? So what, what would you suggest them to first go through these things? Would you say that, okay, this is the documentation, go through that, read it again, and then implement it and come back, I'll teach you. Or what do you do? What was the first step you suggest someone to do? That's a good one. Um, um, yeah, I haven't thought of this one too much. I did have, <laughs> you know, chance of, uh, usually the material that I use is already prepared for me. Uh, but I would say that, uh, uh, you didn't just prime me with your idea. That's actually the right way to do it mm. uh, is to have people first battle something uh, so that they get angry, they get upset, they get uh, engaged, in other words. They yeah. get happy because they solved it, but they don't have an answer to this question. They, all of a sudden, they are engaged. They are ready to go. And now you can talk about the reasons why. right? So, But you let them first battle it. And then when they come back, after they try to battle it is they're ready they're they're open they want to hear yeah uh so i would i would probably do that kind of stuff it's like here's a problem try to solve it couldn't solve it okay let's talk about it 
and then you know some folks are gonna yeah so i that would be a really good technique i you know obviously you know that was that was your idea but it's a good one by the way <laughs> Possibly. um Uh, you know, traditionally, if I had to go do it, I, uh, you know, I work, you know, my job, then it's a little bit more kind of traditional type of company. I probably start talking and showing some slides and then put a problem and then talk about the problem and so on. Uh, but I think the the optimal would be that this is like, welcome, here's a problem. Can you create a computer program that does that? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, well, we usually like we learn the things when we could only able to break them. Yeah. In, in addition to that, I think there's another really interesting thing is that we come to this world um, and there are so many things. There, the, you know, humans before us, before our generation have done so many incredible things. You know, I have a monitor, I have a microphone, I have a headset. I have no idea how they work. I really have no clue. I could not create one of these if the people that create headphones, you know, go away like Who's going to do that? I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, and then so a lot of the times we also uh, assume that there are things that are not worth um, repeating, right? So I think is that there's an evil saying that says, like, don't repeat yourself or, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. No, don't repeat yourself. Sorry. It's the don't reinvent the wheel. Um, for learning, that is a horrible, horrible idea. Yeah. You have to reinvent yes. the wheel. Go ahead and reinvent it because then other otherwise, then you're saying, like, You don't have to learn about what's inside the car. You just have to learn about something else. Innovate. Yeah. Well, I mean, I need to learn about what's inside the car so I can innovate in the car aspect, right? Or, you know, I'm, you don't need to learn about space and what everybody has done about space. Just, you know, innovate. Yeah. Uh, that's stupid. Don't do that. First, recreate all the silly algorithms that are out there hmm. and then try to create something else and improve it and so on. But Always, always, I think the learning has to come with um, a little bit of, um, let's say, uh, like, um, let's say, simple kind of duplication of uh, things. Absolutely. That's that's amazing because this is one of the most frequently asked questions that I, to many people, when, when I go through something, so I'll usually get the recommendation just saying that, don't go through that, just apply that because we, at the end of the day, what we're going to get is a result. So you don't need to go through that. <laughs> so, but what's fascinating is when I gone through the actual, uh, you know, macro chains into the deeper and the logistic regressions and the SVMs and everything, when we go deeper and understand the mathematical things, why well, I realize like I'm using it in a better way than the usual thing you yes. know then i got to realize when you know the crux you're going to use it the best way that you could and also about uh when we think think about the deep reinforcement learning uh we usually don't see uh people talking about it much right when, when we compare it to see supervised and unsupervised and deep deep learnings so what do you think that thing like what what makes a uh, reinforcement learning not much not much popular as supervised or unsupervised like that because it's not the problem that is ahead of uh, it's not the first problem that needs to be solved in order to create human like intelligence that's the only reason why i think is it's something that everybody's going to come around the corner like after if we had you know other components that were uh you know say all deep learning models that do outstanding job i mean i i sure uh, sure we for for our current standards they do currently outstanding job don't get me wrong <laughs> i mean if you look things such as i don't know the gp <clears throat> gpt3 i think it's called the, the this open ai yeah. um uh model that is uh well it's now a train model hmm. that is doing incredible things such as you put it a little you ask in natural language create this uh type of website and boom it creates it yeah. and you know people are applying it for so many cool things like uh you know it create a, a letter for our president you know <laughs> things really really from from the planet i, I just read recently that just uh, two days ago or so Uh, so, you know, those are really uh, great uh, uh, models and, you know, great, um, let's say, accomplishments, but there's still room to go there. And in, and so I think that um, reinforcement learning is a sort of, uh, you know, we'll work on that later. Now, it's like, um, you know, deep learning, not everybody was working uh, deep learning much. If, if we have a couple of uh, good results, and I'm talking about reinforcement learning, that says like, hey, yes, we can actually create these kind of, you know, um, guidance for the agents to <clears throat> do the right things. I don't know really if we ever do. I mean, I'm just talking here, right? <laughs> um, but if we do find, you know, a couple of really cool discoveries, I think people get would get more motivated and more into like, yes, let's, uh, let's now do reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning has had really good results as well. 
Uh, but obviously, nobody is going to deny that those that's because of deep learning. I mean, some of the reinforcement learning methods that we have today are basically exactly the same than 70 years ago, but just adapted yeah. to, to using deep neural networks. That's it. I mean, it's like because deep neural networks are very uh, intrinsic. Right, so we now learn how to do some extra techniques so that it doesn't just blow up on your face. So that's basically what we're doing right now. But but I think that uh, we're gonna come to a place that, that we're gonna continue to do more like really good uh, fundamental research in reinforcement learning, and I think it's perhaps related to rewards and how agents actually consume that. And um, and then at, at one point, uh, I think it, it's gonna it's gonna get much more traction. Totally. Yeah. I, I actually like to the uh, the Jan Lacoon saying like, you know, <laughs> reinforcement learning is the kind of cherry on the cake. That's fine. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I, I don't disagree with that. I think it's true. Uh, I usually like the cherry too, so I, I'll go <laughs> for it. But uh, I, I think he's right in that one. Not, not many people... F- want to go for the cherry first they want to go for the cake I- i'm fine i'm okay <laughs> so what do you say to someone if they are getting started with machine learning and data science would you say them to go directly with the cherry or would you say them to directly go with the cake if they want it, or what, what the people call artificial intelligence go for the cherry I, 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 right away right away because it, it, and also you know and also you know from the bottom of my, bottom of my heart start <laughs> with a problem do not start with the with the solution. Start with a problem. What what are you trying to build? Is it is it computer programs that can distinguish between cats and uh, dogs? Then go ahead and do you know deep neural networks. I mean CNNs and things like that. Go investigate that stuff. Do you do you want eight, uh, things uh, computer programs that uh, learn optimal decision making? So that you basically include the decision in the loop. Uh, usually when you do a classifier is because you want some decision to be made at one point. Yeah. But what you're doing is you're separating the decision making. You're giving the decision making to a human. Well, that's fine. Uh, but if you think that uh, what what you want is ultimately to have those decisions being made by the computer program as well, then I would say go ahead and go with the cherry right away. That's where it's at. Absolutely. And what about this? So what do you think uh, the reinforcement uh, learning lacks in? Like, what are the weaknesses of VRL? Um, <clears throat> let me think about this. This is a good one. I, so I think the, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the disadvantages of reinforcement learning are also their advantages. Uh, so, so here's the thing. The reinforcement learning is about giving control to a computer program, right? Yeah. Um, if you give control to a computer program, all of a sudden, the decisions are taken away from a human. All of a sudden, now, you have a trust issue. You have a validation issue. Yeah. You're telling me that the agent needs to try things that he doesn't think is the best thing ever. It needs to learn. Yes, I'm saying that the the agent will make mistakes and perhaps way too many mistakes, Right. So one of the issues there, for instance, is that the trust, the validation of reinforcement learning agents, the the um, uh, the uh, sample efficiency, right? So how many times do I have to fail? Do I have to let my agent fail so that I can start seeing something good? You know, uh, in some applications, that's not even possible. You cannot say my agent is going to try, you know, if, if in a military application, you can think about that, right? You cannot just say my agent is just going to kill a few folks first to learn that that's really not cool. <laughs> uh, that's not going to happen. That's definitely do, it's not going to happen, right? You can think of a, 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 a trading agent, right? That is, you know, has all your money. Wait, you're saying that my agent is going to play with my money for a little while before he learns to make money for me? No, <laughs> I, I'm not going to let that happen. But unfortunately, that's how you learn. That's how Teja learns how to make money out of the stock, you know, of the stock market, right? So, like, what are you telling me there? Like, why are we quote unquote unfair with reinforcement learning agents? <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm being here, you know, the devil. I'm, I'm not. I'm not being fair here with what I'm saying. Um, reinforcement learning agents need far, far more data. Uh, to actually learn things, and you know, humans, we we have some kind of we are able to kind of transfer, you know, even through analogies, right? And analogies help us to learn things from some other things, right? Yeah. And, and 
um, uh, we need to do so. We need to do transfer learning. We need to do multitask learning. We need to do sample efficiency. So there are some fields there in reinforcement learning that they need to be looked into. Also, validation, verification. I, I already talked about that one. Uh, trust, which is a little bit different. So explainability is what people are call, calling it now. Uh, so those things need to be worked uh, before you know we we feel we have some more traction uh, in reinforcement learning. But you know we're there. <laughs> I think I think it's exciting. I mean, I think the future is exciting. We're really uh, we're really lucky to to be uh, to be in this position. I don't know. I you know you imagine you imagine you know in the fifties when people were doing just knowledge based stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. And you know when I'm speaking to you, I actually feel the energy. So, but I'm usually so interested to find the various approaches that people follow to learn something, right? Um, when I speak to you, I get this thought process, I get this analogy stuff, I get these examples and all of that. So genuinely, like people write differently, they speak differently, they think differently. And guess what? They learn differently, right? So what is your learning style? Like what, what actually, what's process that you follow? Then what's your learning style that you could, that you could make further and further when you try learning something new? Uh, I think implementation, that's that's the one that, <clears throat> um, I don't know, for some reason, and I, I don't know if this is a pro or a con, uh, I realize that uh, oftentimes, even if I read a paper and you know, I see some results, I know that most of these folks are trying really hard to get results that, you know, gives them into a conference. So I don't trust them from the get-go, right? <laughs> I go like, okay, I need to see that you, what you're saying is true. Let me see if I can replicate your results and so on. And it, sometimes it's very challenging. It's actually really challenging to actually, um, you know, do that. I, I think learning-wise, um, that's how I learn. I just try to implement it and then kind of understand, you know, what you're doing and, and things like that. I'm, I'm also a very visual type of person. <laughs> and um, I think that helps me a lot, right, to try to draw things and see components go from one way to another. I think that's also uh, very helpful. Totally. And also, I know you as a teacher, as a content developer at Udacity for the deep reinforcement learning uh, nano degree, that was that was fascinating. And also, like when you are being a project reviewer for them. So people I know a lot of people, uh, my friends who got into the nano degree, they submit the projects taking out from online uh, somewhere in the GitHub projects and they do submit that. Right. So how do you respond to them? Like how what sort of approaches and do you follow to actually let them know this is not the right approach? So what do you? How do you handle them? Oh, I, I that's like like plagiarizing. You mean like a little bit like that? <laughs> well, so you know, so uh, is is a very difficult topic because you know, I mean, I've been in education a lot. Um, I'm I'm kind of ruthless at that. Um, I uh, I usually I'm extremely I'm horrible at that point. I actually let people cheat in my course until the last day of school and then I report them <laughs> and then they think they get an A. No, I'm serious. They think they get an A and then they just get an email saying like you're out of school because you cheated three times for your three projects. So I do these kind of things that I I think are really the proper way. I, I don't have a heart for people that do that because they are not being dishonest to me. They're being dishonest to themselves. And I think those those folks um, are very unfortunate. I. I kind of understand, I mean, I'm, I'm a human too, and I understand the kind of, I'm going to say this, like bootstrapping from others' work, right? So if you go and bootstrap from others' work, you open another window of somebody that already implemented this, hmm. that's fine. Go ahead and look at it, you know, and then re-implement. Even if you have to retype what's already, you know, written on the other side, do not copy and paste though. Your brain what your brain really needs is to break that friction that we talked about early on, right? So you want to break the friction. You just don't know how to break it. Yeah. So go ahead, sure, open the other thing and break your inertia, right? Break it by just looking at somebody else's work and then bring it over to your side and then close that window. You immediately are hooked because now you have something. One technique that I use a lot is that I never have my algorithms not running. So even if they're not doing the thing that they are supposed to be doing, I always have them running so that I can always play that button and see what happens and then have a reason to continue forward, right? If you don't have, if you have something that is totally broken, you're very likely to go like, 
uh, let me just look at somebody else's solution, perhaps. <laughs> but yeah, no, it breaks my heart a lot because a lot of people, a lot of people do that and they really harm themselves. And I, I think it. Um, I don't know. I wish that everybody in the world would understand that it's just fun. Just go ahead and learn. I mean, try it. Bang your head. And if you cannot do it, just don't do it. Submit zero. That's it. Like, you know, say, world, I didn't do it well this time. That No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. Just keep at it. Keep trying. That's what you want. That's what you, that's what I want anyway from my students that they keep trying. It doesn't, I don't, I don't look for people that get A's. I don't, I mean, Honestly, I didn't get all A's when I did my program. I got a couple of uh, B's, right? So uh, I think the the message is keep trying, really. that the, the point is that you keep trying, keep being engaged. Um, and, you know, hopefully, I, I would hope that a lot of people at least, you know, try to try. <laughs> uh uh, because ultimately, I think that would be that would be a, a better that would make a better world. You yeah. know, do, do, I think you know people really trying their best with their hearts, right? Now I'm not talking about just everything. Absolutely, yeah, I totally get that. I totally get that. And you know, I, you are also being head teaching assistant and also an instructional associate, um, where you get a chance to communicate with the students, right? You get a chance to explain them. You get a chance to look at their thought process. You get a chance to actually understand the way that they solve the problem, right? So when you actually start communicating with them and trying to solve their problems, so what are those common mistakes that you see uh, your students are making, maybe in ML or maybe in RL or any other? things so specifically let's talk about reinforcement learning and machine learning so yeah in reinforcement learning uh there so i, I think uh, i mean there are many <laughs> uh, so i would say that one of one of one of them is uh um um oh i don't know if you want specific cases though i i, I don't know if because your question seems more general but uh you know I, I i right now i have like specific cases in my head like, you know, like mistaking value iteration, which is a specific algorithm uh, for a reinforcement learning algorithm, because a lot of people call it model based reinforcement learning, but it's just so confusing. And it's not good for students to think of it as reinforcement learning because it's a planning algorithm. So those kind of little things, I think, you know, a new person, a, co a person coming to reinforcement learning has a big challenge, which is it's a lot of discrepancy on the on the way that people name things. Uh, and and I, and I don't know if it's because it's not being really standardized. I, I would say Rich, Rich Sutton's book is the standard, is the gold standard to me anyway. Uh, so we should all try to use their, I mean, Rich Sutton and Andy Bartow, sorry, uh, their book, um, you know, to kind of like, uh, or, or their book, sorry, their um, kind of terminology, right? The way that they explain things and so on. But, you know, there's some things that I feel that my students would understand better if I explain them in a slightly different way. So I think that those are those are the things where, you know, I would say like, quote unquote, common mistakes that people make is that they come in, they read, they read a blog post. Right. <laughs> and then they say like, oh, I read this in the blog post. And you're like, yeah, that blog post is not correct. So <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's not right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's kind of fortunate because you think that you, you go online and you say like, oh, but it's a blog post. It has to be right. <laughs> yeah. you know, no, no, it is not. <laughs> so um, I, I would say that I, I think maybe getting resources that are really not, uh, you know, good resources. And I've uh, honestly, when I was uh, writing my book, I was like, uh, you know, I had to buy like every single competitor's book. Right. To just like find like what they're doing and how they're doing it just to try to create a good you know material like what mm -hmm. are they doing uh and many of these books are wrong i'm, I'm saying like wrong not even like <laughs> almost wrong or have a mistake like they talk about value iteration as a model free reinforcement learning method like what are you talking about that's not what it is so it kind of hurts me because it's a whole book. People think that because it's a book, it's a good resource, yeah. and it is not. Uh, I think that would be probably the main if we can if we can abstract it away and make it not a specific case, but as something more general. I would say looking at at uh, anything published as gospel. That is, don't even trust me. I don't I don't want you to do that. You as a student need to get many 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 different resources. And learn from multiple, uh, you know, well, multiple sources in this case, so that you can actually have a really good understanding, your own understanding uh, of this. Or maybe that, yeah. Absolutely, and you know, 
uh, when when people find out like the uh, young people who are being uh, engineering graduates so or any other people so if they wanted to learn uh, machine learning or getting into reinforcement learning in in the field of data right so would you recommend uh, take some time get into the masters and expo- get a good exposure and learn the best and go deeper into the algorithms and come again so is that the way you recommend or get get into the company work on the problems break them up understand and then go ahead so what, there's like two ways right so what would you recommend well hopefully if we if we move to fully online uh and you know there's already a master <laughs> that allows you to do this you actually do both no no you actually I, i'm honest with that i i actually i am i i don't know i'm say i'm lucky i mean i'm not young i'm i'm 36 actually just turned in uh, august 4th so i'm i'm not super young but i've been you know doing masters uh in for well first you know my bachelor's in venezuela then i worked in bachelor's here then i worked a little bit then i started just working and studying at the same time with uh with a master saying you know what's ahead i'm not i'm not stop i'm not done you know i'm 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 not stopping anytime soon either um so i think that that is uh, you get a lot of uh really valuable things from both sides you know like when you when you go to a company and then you go like oh you know i know about this algorithm and then uh they ask you questions that doesn't questions that are not relevant or not talked about for instance in a school like how do i trust that algorithm oh well i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> so now all of a sudden you have to learn how to you know what's what's going on in their research of uh, explainability because for us to actually release this particular agent we need to actually uh, uh you know kind of package the agent with some trust component I, what but trust is subjective what are you talking about right so i would say that um they they're not uh exclusive mutually exclusive you don't have to do one or the other but i would say go as far in both in in both so go as far get be the the top professional in the world and be the top academic in the world uh, i think it's possible because obviously and this is only with a caveat that you're doing exactly the same thing i mean i'm lucky enough to to be doing reinforcement learning at work in my book at georgia tech and you know when i was studying and if if i continue to study i would be doing reinforcement learning <laughs> as well uh so i'm not saying I'm not saying do five different things. That's not a good advice. You're doing the same thing in a bunch of different mediums, right? So you're these guy, these people, the crowd in my company asked me for something. The crowd uh, in uh, Georgia Tech asked me for something completely different. You know, if I was doing research, I know that I would be asking ask completely different questions, right? So I think that that it makes you much much stronger at the one thing that you do, which is in my case reinforcement learning. Absolutely yeah that's that's so clear i mean what i get from your words is possibly that you got to choose the best of all right you got to be the intersection of best of all of that right you from being from the academia you take the best and you being from the workplace you take the best and you learn it right what what about if someone ahead of if someone is actually getting into want to do masters uh in in data science so maybe in georgia tech so they are trying out to get in from online as how you did so what would you suggest from suggest them like what sort of steps that you have to follow all, uh, of course we're going to go through the web page but it's so good like if you could actually explain that to the listeners like how they can actually uh, reach out and what are the process they can follow up to actually uh, get into the online master's degree program at Georgia Tech um <clears throat> so before you get in uh there's really not much to do um uh other than you know try to get in i i'll be honest with you um the community once you get in the community inside is wonderful 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 we have uh slack organizations that are for Georgia Tech folks um you are going to you're going to get uh friends you're going to have people even you know in your same country in your same city in your same time zone you perhaps are going to be going into a library with somebody of your uh that is studying the same you know uh course that you are studying i mean it's such a large community at this point hmm. that i think is fantastic it's really really good so i would say uh, you know it's kind of hard before you get in i know there's a reddit uh, uh page that Uh, or i guess it's sub ready it's called i don't know i'm not really uh into that but anyway so there is a uh, some kind of page community that people ask questions before they get in and things like that 
has nothing to do with when, once you come in and once you're in the classroom and start making friends, th this is going to happen. You're going to see, I'm going to go and be, you know, asking a question and then Teja, you're, you're studying as well. And then you're answering my question and asking another question. And all of a sudden, you know, we kind of, I kind of see your name. I can, you kind of see mine. And then once we get to another course and all of a sudden I see you in the next course together, all of a sudden it's like, Hey, Teja, <laughs> one time, I, wow, this is awesome. We're going to share the same course. All of a sudden you have friends and that happens with like 10 folks, not just with one, yeah. 10 different guys, right? Because it's such a large community. Um, and then, so I, I, I actually think it's awesome. I, I, people should, I think people should enroll into, uh, into that program no matter what, you learn so much. I mean, if you don't have a master's and, mm. or, or if you want to do it, if you have another master's and you want to also have a master from Georgia Tech, I think that is a great, uh, um, it's an experience unlike any other experience. I can assure you that. Super. That's cool. That's cool. That's, I mean, that should probably help with someone actually trying out to get into uh, a master's degree because this is a situation where it's so hard to go to another location like Georgia and study there. It's going to be really, really hard in the pandemic, right? So it will definitely help them. Your words will definitely make them to actually give it a try, look at them, and then they could make a decision about it. So super. And, uh, I think I had an amazing discussion with you. That's that's the thing that I, the whole question that I have. I was just asking you like, <laughs> and I really love your analogies and your great answers along there. Like, thank you so much. And uh, you remember uh, we got the AMA form released uh, two days ago. Now two days. It's quite long. Okay. <laughs> so I just picked on a time constraint. I'm gonna give you around three questions. All right. So let's go with the first one. Heritage. So it's by uh, Joseph Murad. He's the one who interviewed you last time <laughs> in his podcast, Engineering uh, Mind. Is that the one? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you see the changes of uh, getting a job in RL with and without a PhD? Yeah, yeah. So I yeah, I saw the question. I, um, um, well, I have a, a job in, in, in RL and I don't have a PhD, hmm. okay? <laughs> that doesn't mean that I'm not going to get one. Again, I'm throwing that out there. I'm just saying. But, um, yes, I don't uh, – so I think the difference is this. So if you don't have a PhD, you definitely have some knowledge, some gap in knowledge, right? And you should be fine with that. You should be okay with that. There's some other folks that have that knowledge that don't have your knowledge. You understand? So – yeah. That's the important, I think that's the most important aspect is that one, sometimes people get very centered in themselves like, oh, but I'm not really good at this, but I'm not really good at that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, just go ahead and, and join forces with folks that, you know, know other things. So if you don't have a PhD, you're going to be doing more of, um, so either, uh, uh, software engineering or research engineering, which is more like, so let's say, like apply research, which is what I do, research engineering, or you were, you're you're not going to be able to do really good uh, research uh, science, right? So you, so the, uh, the, the role I'm talking about here, I'm, I probably need to say the role. The role is research, research scientist, research engineer, and then computer engineer. If you don't have a PhD, you probably won't be doing you you won't getting be getting a job as a research scientist. You'll be you'll be getting a job as a, either a software engineer or a research engineer. Yeah. Now try to be really good at those things, right? So just try to be good at those, um, which I think is valuable. Uh, is not it's not the same thing as having a PhD. But again, you didn't spend five years of your life trying to solve <laughs> things that those folks did. So don't don't think that you could. Um, and, and I, and I think that, you know, that's a, a, a big thing that lots of folk, uh, so look, I think lo a lot of people limit themselves because they don't have their full, you know, they say like, oh, when I become, I don't know, like level five, that's when I'm going to be, I'm going to do what I love. Don't do that. Don't do that. Try to get that job that you love. Try to get that job as soon as possible. Uh, and do your part, you know? And I think, I, in my, yeah, in my book, somewhere in the, at the end of the book, I said something like, you know, it's like a choir, right? Like everybody's singing their tone and stuff like that. Just don't feel that you need to sing the entire thing. Like, you know, you're not the star. Forget about it. You are a single part on the entire community. So just be happy with that. Now, that, be, that all being said, uh, I think that if you can get a PhD, you should. 
I think if you can, you should. I think it's uh, there is a lot of really beautiful things in there, and you should. Great, great. Uh, that's that's so really good. I mean, I couldn't even you know uh, express how how well it was said, but that's amazing. So, and then the next one we got: uh, Can we express a fake news detected problem as a map? The agent is rewarded for detecting fake news from real ones, where the environment can be tweeted. Uh, I, I guess we could. I you know for some reason. When it's a, a, a matter of uh, kind of detecting things, um, I, I would probably not use reinforcement learning. I mean, if your problem is just to detect fake news from, you know, real news, um, you know, there, if you think about it, is there decision making there? Well, sure, you can kind of box it as a decision making problem, but it's really not a decision. It's a detection, right? So yeah. it's a perhaps classification, it's perhaps a... You know, so it's a, it's a, I think it's more a supervised type of uh, learning problem or, uh, or even some, you know, aspect of unsupervised that you need to extract some features there that are common and stuff, but there's no decision making. So I would advise not to go with that as the first route. Now, can you do that? Yes, you can. Uh, but I don't think it, um, you know, I mean, you would have to ask lots of different questions when I, when I have to design an environment basically, or, or make a problem a reinforcement learning problem. I usually go first with, um, you know, it, believe it or not, you just look at the definition of an NDP, which is a very basic, you know, thing that gets that 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 people learn in reinforcement learning. It's a mark of decision process. Well, in reality, I do palm DPs, but anyway, I don't want to get complex. And the the MDP is you know has states, actions, rewards, and so on. So what I do is I just go through each of those. And then create my states are gonna be this, my actions are gonna be this, my you know rewards gonna be this transition and so on, and then I go and basically play the game, play the game. I become the agent and interact with this environment. And usually you can you know you can frame many problems into that framework. Super, yeah. And here we go with the next one. So you have uh, another one. So I would be really interested to hear more about the research that is being done at Lockheed Martin in regard to reinforcement learning. What does the research process look like there? Does Lockheed Martin allow a decent amount of freedom to research scientists? Um, decent amount of freedoms to get to a solution, yes. Uh, dif decent amount of freedom to... Uh, uh, to uh, let's say to kind of change the solution, redefine the solution. No, the solution <laughs> is very specific, right? You you need something to happen. Period. You need something to happen. Period. Within some bounds, okay. Uh, and things cannot happen. Period. So, uh, you know, because of the application applying uh, reinforcement learning uh, uh, solutions, which have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you need to accept that they need to. Uh, interact with the environment, whether they are optimal or not. So meaning they need to learn, they need to make mistakes. Uh, in a military application, that is a really, really uh, uncomfortable discussion. It's a really uncomfortable discussion first, and it's actually very challenging as well because, you know, you can get in trouble, in big trouble. I mean, it's not, even I can get in trouble just by saying, you know, that, right? <laughs> uh, in, let alone a company. Imagine a company... Um, trying to get a solution that doesn't get it right. So there is not much freedom in that area, but if there's a lot of freedom to get there, it's just that you need to make sure that uh, things go exactly as planned. And and I think that's a good thing though. I, I don't think that's a, that's a bad thing. That's a good thing because, that, and that's why I think that, you know, um, academic and industry are two completely, completely different ball games, right? Yeah. You have different constraints in here and then there you don't have constraints. So if you want freedom, you know, you become a professor, you do whatever you want, right? The, but if you want, if you just want things to, to work, you want to see things working, uh, then, then there are constraints and lots of them. <laughs> That's cool. That's beautifully said. And that's the end of this conversation with all the questions that you had and you are answers. Uh, literally blew my mind very honestly. They were so deep and they're so vulnerable. And thank you so much for being so transparent as well. <laughs> so that's being said. Yeah. So would you like to share something to our listeners? That's a very huge takeaway that you could take away from this conversation. Would you like to share something? I, I'm just going to thank you. Your your answers were really interesting, though. I mean, you actually, I guess you, you do work a lot before, uh, uh, you know, asking questions and things like that. It seems that all 
all of the questions seem to be very well connected and prepared. So I, I actually enjoy this time a lot. <laughs> awesome. Didn't so. realize it's like oh, oh, over an hour. My goodness, <laughs> I'm having fun. But no, thank you, Teddy. I, I just appreciate uh, appreciate uh, your your work uh, prior to to this uh, podcast. Appreciate Absolutely. It. So I just frame up a few questions for you. But the connections, I didn't know that just comes in because uh, your conversations, your answers are so much uh, deep, so that I could connect back with my intention, so that we could frame a beautiful conversation. So that's how it went up. So that's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for that. So and also a big takeaway from this conversation to the listeners is that Manning is giving away uh, free books of I mean, maybe about three or four copies about of uh, reinforcement learning. So they should definitely check out the description about taking um, Miguel's book. <laughs> It's about grokking deep reinforcement learning. They should definitely check out and go there, get into the challenge. You can be lucky to get a free copy of Miguel's grokking deep, le deep reinforcement learning. And that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Miguel. So would you like to share something to the listeners uh, before that? Just like a, yeah, let's do this. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, I hope you you uh, get the book. I actually put lots of hours in there. I think you can learn a lot out of that book, and uh, you know, give me your feedback. I, you know, I usually say is I'm, I'm a reinforcement learning agent as well. I learn through rewards and you know feedback. Just feedback. Give me the feedback. Let me know what you like out of you know from the book, and uh, I'm sure that we can make it better. We can make it worse. No, we're not gonna make it worse. No, we can we can we can tune it uh, so that uh, so that it is better and better each time. I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, my hope is that people really learn from it, really use it, and learn. Yeah, and I can actually feel that from the actual descriptions of the book. Like in the manner you your words are so concise and they are very vivid. So, and also what I get from that words, and also when I'm going through a book. Uh, you should definitely check out the analogies what Miguel is making there. They are full of fun and they are actually full of information. You can you can literally understand them with such an analogy. So definitely, I, <laughs> I would highly recommend it. If you have a chance, if you have time, uh, make sure Miguel, you should add even more uh, analogies with full of stories and all of that. <laughs> so that should help us. By the way, many... Many or most of those analogies are real. So even though I do, uh, you know, talk about my daughter and things like that, I I actually mean it. Those things happened. Uh, but yeah, and, and what I was trying to do is mostly to 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 give people their so the opportunity to think about their own uh, lives and how to you know to see that reinforcement learning really applies or many of the concepts there actually apply to their own life. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Miguel. It was an amazing conversation. The energy what you are given and you put in will be definitely having a value for it. Will be definitely uh, the listeners would be taking something learning from this and they can actually implement that. So possibly make sure you digest your conversations <laughs> <laughs> and then you move forward with the uh, execution just like that. So thank you so much, Miguel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for the giveaways. Yeah, a huge thank you for all of this. Thank you, Teja. I really appreciate it. Thank you.